Bhagavate Vasudevaya We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 8, Chapter 3, entitled Gajendra's Prayers of Surrender, Text 6. Gajendra was certainly not living a God-conscious life. He was living as an animal in the form of an elephant in the forest. <coughs> beautiful forest and was totally absorbed in thinking I am this body and all of the relatives and all of the things that are in relationship to this body are mine. so much deeply engrossed in all of these objects all around him that he was completely forgetful of who he really was in a, or of his real self-interest. Until the greatest tragedy that had ever come upon him. A situation beyond his control. <clears throat> the tendency of the conditioned soul in this world is we want to be controller. Bhakti Vinod wrote a song Kumi Sarveshwareshwara Brajendra Kumar. That Brajendra Kumar, that small son of Nanda Maharaj, is in truth the controller of all controllers. Ishwara Parama Krishna Sachi Ananda Vigra. Everyone in this material existence, to one extent or another, wants to be Ishwara or controller. <coughs> but the absolute truth is Parama Ishwara. He is the supreme controller. For those under this illusion who want to control, we want to control other people, we want to control the items or objects around us, we want to control our own body and mind, but ultimately the forces of material nature are designed by the Lord to sooner or later frustrate all of our attempts, to reveal to us how we are actually always under the control of higher powers. <clears throat> it is an embarrassing situation for a person who has gained great pride and recognition for being a powerful controller, to be put in a helpless condition. It's very humbling. 
So here is the, here is the apparent controller of the entire forest, Gajendra. <coughs> in a state of crisis that is totally beyond his control. He's in the jaws of a crocodile. And he's fighting with this crocodile for a long time. And he's getting weaker and weaker and weaker as the crocodile is getting stronger and stronger. until it comes to the point where he realizes that he is defeated. There is no chance. <clears throat> as long as he thought there was a chance, he kept fighting. And he fought valiantly. Sometimes it appeared it was, he was going to win. With his great strength, he would drag the crocodile out of the water And everyone around, can you imagine? It was like the ultimate tournament or match. If there were any other crocodiles in the audience, they were for the crocodile. <laughs> And all the other animals in the forest. Of course, those who were afraid of Gajendra were cheering for the crocodile. But all those who were protected by him and his family members, when he would drag the crocodile out of the water, they were, he's going to win, he's going to win. But then the crocodile dragged him back in the water. And they were going in and out and in and out. Who is going to win this fight? <clears throat> At the beginning, nobody knew. Certainly, everyone must have been confident Gajendra has to win. What is this little crocodile compared to him? And every time we find Krishna plays games with his devotees sometimes. What to speak of how material nature does. <coughs> When Lord Narasimha was fighting with Hiranyakashipu, the Lord captured Hiranyakashipu in his arms. And then Hiranyakashipu was fighting very, very strongly and he got out. He got out of the Lord's grips, and Hiranyakashipu was under the illusion, you see, he cannot hold me, he cannot control me, I am more powerful than him. <coughs> It is described that the Lord was playing with Hiranyakashipu like a cat plays with a mouse. <laughs> Now actually the cat could just eat the mouse in a second. But usually cats like to play. So they'll grab the mouse, and then they'll let it go. And the mouse is thinking, ha ha, I am more powerful than this cat. He cannot hold me. <laughs> and then the cat grabs him again, and then lets him go, and then grabs him and lets him go. That's the way Lord Narasimha was playing with Hiranyakashipu. But Hiranyakashipu was under the illusion that he was winning. Mayadhyakshena prakriti suyate sachara chara. Krishna says, I am the controller of this entire material energy. Maya is his external bahiranga shakti. It's the energy of the Lord. Factually, that is the same exact way Maya plays with everyone in this creation. She plays with us. And she gives us a chance to think that we're winning, that we're going to be successful. However big we are, whether we're kings, prime ministers, presidents, powerful financers of governments, or just common farmers, the fact is, We are all like insignificant, helpless mice. You're just a little tiny mouse, not even a rat, just a little mouse. 
in the paws of the cat of Maya. And she's playing with you. We think we're controlling, but the fact is we are always 100% completely under control. Krishna does give us free will. We have the right to control our own free will. But outside of that, we're simply controlled. <clears throat> And in material life, unless you surrender to Krishna, you cannot win the game. You have to lose. So Gajendra was factually much stronger than any of us. He was much more influential in his environment than any of us. And actually, he's representing all of us. So in the crocodile's mouth, he's fighting passionately. And that's all he's thinking about, is his next move, how to get out. But when he actually understands He's finished. <clears throat> There's nothing else he could do. He's really helpless and he is defeated. And all, even though he has this huge, gigantic body at the prime of his youth, it's about to be killed. And all the things that he is controlling over is about to be ripped away from him and all the relatives and loved ones and other people, animal people, that are connected to him, they are all forever going to be ripped from his life. Very sobering reality. In that state, the Paramatma within his heart <clears throat> Sarvasya cha ham ridishkandi vishto matasmatir jnanam apohanam cha. Krishna tells in Gita, in the, I am in the heart of every living being, and from me comes remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. We're only forgetful to, of Krishna because Krishna sanctions it. It is our will, so Krishna reciprocates. But we cannot remember Krishna without the grace of Krishna either. <clears throat> Somehow, because Gajendra was actually a very serious devotee in his past life, and he pleased Krishna, even though he made a mistake and he was cursed and he fell down to the animal species, Still, Krishna remembered everything that he had done in the past. And as the Upanishad explains, it is like two birds in the same tree. One bird is very eager to eat the fruits of the tree. Sometimes the fruits are sweet and the bird enjoys. Sometimes the fruit is bitter and the bird suffers. And that bird just continues to go from one branch to another branch to another branch to another, trying to find sweet fruits. The other bird is completely detached from the tree. He's simply there because he loves the other bird. He's just there waiting. Turn to me, and I will give you everything. I will give you myself. I will give you this, 
I will give you the true immortal sweetness that you're looking for in these insignificant fruits. Just turn to me. And as soon as, a, as soon as that bird turns, immediately the, the Lord bird gives himself. So in the same way, Krishna is within our heart. He's just waiting. We're trying to be controllers. We're trying to be enjoyers. We're trying to be proprietors. And the Lord is just waiting. Neha bhikramana sosti pratyavayo nividyate swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. Because devotional service is transcendental. Any effort is eternal. It is never lost. And it will be there to save us from the greatest fear whenever we really need it. So here is an example. When Gajendra was in the greatest crisis, the greatest fear, because of his past devotional service, he was able to turn to God. Not only could he turn to God, but he remembered the beautiful prayers that he had learned in his previous life. It's amazing. Gajendra is an elephant and he's chanting slokas in perfect Sanskrit. That's the Lord in his heart, giving him that remembrance at the time when he needs it the most. And here Gajendra <clears throat> because the Lord is revealing himself within Gajendra's heart, Gajendra is revealing such deep mysteries. He's praying to Krishna that no one can understand you. Like an actor on the stage who's dancing and dressing in various ornaments. Is not understood by his audience. Similarly, the activities and features of the supreme artist cannot be understood even by the demigods or great sages, and certainly not by ordinary people. Because we want to be the controller, intellectually, our human tendency is we want to control God in the name of religion. This is the problem. Why is there so much conflict? Why is there all this terrorism and hatred and bigotry and <coughs> fundamental um, <clears throat> fundamentalism that, that, that leads to divisions. This is the core reason. Because we still have this ego that we want to be the controller. And now we want to control God. God is what I want him to be. God is what my interpretation is. And if your interpretation is different than me, you are dangerously wrong. And either you should be avoided or you should be destroyed. It's the false ego. It's the very thing that God comes to this world to reveal, to relieve us of. This desire to control. And we're intellectually using it on him. <clears throat> I know. I am the proprietor of the true understanding of God. B 
भोक्तरां जगतापसां सार्वलोकमहेश्वरां सूर्यदं सार्वभूतानां ज्ञातवमां शांति मृच्छति कृष्ण says if you want to be peaceful you have to understand कृष्ण is the proprietor of everything you're not the proprietor of anything and certainly not God you can't even be the proprietor of the least of his objects of material energy what to speak of the proprietor of the supreme absolute truth himself But that's actually what's happening. So Gajendra, because he's honestly and sincerely surrendering, these revelations are manifesting by Krishna's grace within his heart. That there's only one way to understand God. And there will never be any other way. And that is when God reveals himself to us. There is no other way. The infinitesimal has no power on its own to understand the infinite. But the infinitesimal has the power given by the infinite to understand according to what the infinite wants to reveal. If one simply understands the nature of Krishna's appearance and activities in this world, one never has to take birth in this world again. One attains the ultimate for t perfection of going back to the spiritual world. But we cannot understand by our philosophical prowess, by our fertile intelligence. We can only understand when the Lord is pleased to reveal himself to us. Krishna tells in Gita, evam param praptam. I can be understood through disciplic succession. When Krishna speaks Bhagavad Gita and we understand his message through, through the way he has ordered to understand through parampara or disciplic succession, we're getting the absolute version of how this material existence is working, why it is working, who we are, who is God, what is our relationship with God, what is real happiness, what is real liberation. Krishna is revealing it all. There's nothing to figure out. It's all there. The only thing to figure out is when we're going to do what he says. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevi. I have revealed everything. It's all coming down in disciplic succession. If you want to know the truth of me, you approach a guru who knows me. This is Krishna's plan. And we may have our own, our own plans, but they will not work. It's 100% guaranteed it cannot work. We can start our own religions, we can start our own paths, we can, we can attract millions of followers, but we cannot know God until God is pleased to reveal himself to us and God gives the method. We have to humble ourselves and surrender. And part of the humbling of ourselves and surrender is to accept Krishna's method, Krishna's instruction. So here, Gajendra is revealing this beautiful truth, how no one can understand the Absolute except the Absolute. And when the Absolute wants to reveal himself to us, we can know him in full, according to our capacity. 
That is the path of grace. Only by the grace of God can we know God in truth. <clears throat> and there are so many examples of even very, very great and realized devotees. If Krishna doesn't want to reveal himself to them, they cannot understand. There was great devotees in the time of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who really misunderstood Lord Nityananda. It's described in Chaitanya Bhagavat. One devotee, he didn't want to make offenses, but he didn't, he just was so disturbed. He left Bengal and traveled all the way to Jagannath Puri just to reveal his mind to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He wasn't an ordinary material person. He was a Vaishnav. He was a special Vaishnav. But he realized that he was starting to make offenses to a great soul. But there was nothing he could do about it. So it was an emergency. He went all the way to Puri just to approach Lord Chaitanya. And this happened on several occasions. Different people. One, when Lord Nityananda, when Lord Nityananda Prabhu kicked Shivananda Sain in the chest and cursed Shivananda Sain to lose everything he had, what was most dear to him, when Shivananda Sain was just giving his life and soul only to please Lord Nityananda, this was really strange. This person ran ahead and told Lord Chaitanya, you know, this, this is what's happening. <laughs> Another person, he, he saw Lord Nityananda Prabhu, who's supposed to be in the renounced order, and he's wearing, he's supposed to be a saint, and he's wearing jewelry made out of gold and rubies and diamonds and emeralds and silver. He has bangles and necklaces and earrings, ankle bells. And he has turbans and, cl and cloth of the finest silks. And he's holding a golden staff. This person is thinking, what kind of a saintly person is this? So he went all the way to Puri just to say to Lord Chaitanya, I I'm really confused about this Nityananda Prabhu. And Lord Chaitanya was none different than Nityananda Prabhu. Prajendra Nandana Jay Sachi Sutta Hoilo Se Balarama Hoilo Nitai. Lord Krishna came as Lord Chaitanya and Balaram came as Nitai. So when Lord Chaitanya heard these stories, he was in ecstasy. The other person was in agony. Lord Chaitanya was in ecstasy because he understood. He understood that Lord Nityananda was giving the highest mercy and love and affection to Shivananda Sain. You cannot understand. Shivananda Sain understood it. When his wife heard, I curse your, I, this Shivananda saying has caused me such inconvenience, I curse his children to die. Now what do you think the mother is going to think? She was devastated. And then Shivananda saying gets kicked by Nityananda in the chest. After working so hard, giving his life, his entire income, his everything just to please Lord Nityananda. This is the result. He gets chastised, cursed that his children die, and he gets kicked in the chest. And Shivananda Sain was the happiest man in the world. There could be no one happier than him. He said, the same feat that even Brahma and Shiva meditate on for millions of years and never achieve 
have today blessed my chest. <laughs> and he knew that Nityananda Prabhu, whatever he does is for the good of everyone. Actually, his children didn't die. They grew up to be old people and they all became great famous saints. Some of the greatest saints in the history of our Vaishnava tradition are the children of Shivananda Sain. So when Nityananda would curse them to die, he actually blessed them to live long lives <laughs> and be completely empowered lovers of God. That was his way of blessing them. Now, who can understand? Shivananda Sain could understand because he was surrendered. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told this person that the ornaments on Lord Nityananda's body are the personified forms of devotional service. The nine processes of devotional service are personally decorating Lord, are, have personified themselves to personally decorate Lord Nityananda Prabhu's body. Those are not just jewels and gold. That's pure spiritual substance. That's the ornament of his supreme devotion and love. And besides that, he's in the mood of a cowherd boy. So Lord Chaitanya could understand Lord Nityananda. Why? Because he is Lord Nityananda. Only Krishna can understand himself. And only Krishna can reveal to him, to, to any of us, his purpose, who he is. And Gita tells, Yeya tamam prapadyante tams tataiva pachalyaha. According to the surrender, that we offer to the Lord, the Lord reveals himself. According to how we surrender to the Lord within our heart, according to how we surrender to the service of Vaishnavas, according to how we surrender to the will of the Guru, according to how we surrender to be the servant of all living beings on behalf of the Lord, the Lord reveals. Prabhupada begins his purport of a similar understanding was expressed by Kunti Devi. She was very much like Gajendra, but for many years. She was in the crocodile of despair for decades. Her children were banished to the forest for 12 years. And before that, there were so many problems. And after that, there were so many problems. And in the end, she thanked Krishna for all these calamities. Because, because in those calamities, she realized she's not the controller. She's helpless. And she turned to Krishna with an open and honest and sincere heart. And Krishna revealed to her everything. He revealed himself. And she also understood that nobody can understand you, Krishna. Even Bhishma, one of the twelve Mahajans, he gave the same conclusion while he's laying in his bed of arrows. <clears throat> he's talking to Yudhisthira Maharaj and then offering his prayers to Krishna. He's saying, why is it that the Pandavas, who are pure, without any envy, want to do everything for the welfare of others, in the service of God, why did the Pandavas have to go through a whole history 
of persecution, misunderstanding, and distress. And how is it that the Kurus, headed by Duryodhana for so many years, they were happy, they were ruling over the world, and they had everything that they wanted. Why does Krishna allow this to happen to his devotee? Now Bhishma, who was one of the most intelligent people in the whole creation, was the son of Ganga Devi. He was a very powerful being. He was trained in the scriptures by the demigods. He was trained in etiquette and fighting by the demigods. He was a very, very special person. He was so intelligent that when Yudhisthira Maharaj was lamenting over all the people killed in the battle of Kurukshetra, and he was blaming himself for the whole thing, Krishna, Krishna purposely tried to pacify him, but couldn't. <laughs> this is Krishna. He wanted to glorify his devotee. Krishna loves to glorify his devotee. During the churning of the ocean of milk, when all that poison came out, the devatas approached Vishnu and he said, let's go to Shiva. So they all went to Shiva. Krishna loves to see his devotee glorified. So Krishna brought Yudhisthira Maharaj and the Pandavas all the way to Kurukshetra from Hastinapur just to learn the highest truths from Bhishma. Krishna is more or less saying, Bhishma knows better than me. Of course, everyone knows that whatever he knows, he's getting from Krishna. This is how intelligent Bhishma is. And Bhishma is saying that how is it that the innocent and perfect devotees, the Pandavas, had to go through so much suffering and their mother Kunti had to go through so much distress? And Bhishma said, no one, not even the greatest sages, philosophers, yogis, or anyone can understand the inconceivable will of the Lord. The Lord is so inconceivable. Sometimes a child, the parents want to teach the child a good lesson. And the little child can't understand, why is he doing this to me? Why is my mother and father doing this to me? This is not right. I don't like it. And then they start chastising their mother and father. But the mother and father have their reason. They have very mature, wide-spectrum, full picture of what's best for the child. The child only knows one little, you know, what, what their situation is at the moment. Yes? We are all the little children of Krishna. Aham bija pratapita. He is our mother and father. And he is the supreme intelligent. And he knows what's best for his devotees. He knows what's best. He knows what we need. We may not understand. But we understand through Krishna's instructions the principle. And we accept that. Some people who want to be controllers in the name of scholarship <clears throat> or in the name of logic, they're against faith. Why do you have faith in the scriptures? Why do you have faith in the saints? We should scientifically, logically try to understand things with our own intelligence. That's the most logical and scientific way of understanding things is to have faith. 
that's the reality. <laughs> because there's no way to really understand the background of how things are working. We may, be we may be able to understand to a very, very minute degree the external appearance of things. But we cannot f penetrate through the external to enter into the background of why and how. So fa factually, faith in the proper sources is the most logical scientific way of understanding truth. Because Krishna is inconceivable. And material nature is inconceivable because it's Krishna's energy. Actually, everything's inconceivable. Nothing that exists is not inconceivable to understand it as it is. The soul is inconceivable. This body that we're living in is quite inconceivable. What to speak of the source of everything? So Krishna, he gave us a method to have faith, faith in his words. He's revealing himself. Srila Prabhupada explains here that he comes as Lord Ram, he comes as Krishna, he comes as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He comes in so many ways, in so many religions throughout the world to reveal the truth. But then again, in order to even understand these truths that are revealed in the scriptures by the saints in various traditions, even to understand them properly, it's only possible through surrender. We may be very proud. <clears throat> that so many people are speculating about what man mana bhava mad bhakto means. Yes, always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, offer your homage unto me. Some people are saying this means the unmanifest, impersonal, all-pervading absolute within Krishna. But we understand Bhagavad Gita as it is, where, Krishna, where through parampara, through the guru-disciplic succession, we're getting the actual understanding of what Krishna says. We may have the conception. Other people may have misconceptions. We, have, we may have the right conception. But that doesn't mean you understand it. Other people don't understand because they have the wrong conception. You may have the right conception. But what does it take to understand the right conception? There's a difference between the two. <clears throat> There's a difference between having a glass of water and actually being able to drink it and get the nourishment. Yes? Prabhupada has given us the best vitamins. But unless we eat it and digest it, what's the use? So we have the, we have the perfect conceptions. But we can only understand them according to our surrender. So just because we have the best, it doesn't mean we're the best. means you have the best opportunity. The other day, Narahari Prabhu gave a very nice class and he read from a particular verse of a purport of Srila Prabhupada where he was quoting Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur that you can chant the holy names birth after birth after birth after birth but you'll never understand Krishna until you're Trinadat Bhisunichena Taror Ibasahishnana Amani Namana Dena Kirtan Yasadahari Until you are humble like the grass tolerant like a tree eager to offer all respect to others and not concerned with respect for oneself when you chant the name in that spirit, you can understand Krishna. Until you adopt that spirit, 
Birth after birth after birth after birth, you can chant three lakhs of drowns every day. And you won't understand. You won't even understand the holy name. It's a matter of surrender. There are so many examples. That Brahman and Sri Rangam, he could not intellectually comprehend the Gita. There were other people who intellectually had absolute mastery over it. They had it memorized. They could probably explain any scripture in dozens of different ways. It mesmerized, could mesmerize, mesmerize crowds of people. But this Brahmin couldn't even pronounce it properly. And he didn't even know what it meant, intellectually. But he had complete understanding of Krishna. Because he was so sincere and humble in his surrender to his Guru and the Lord. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I rev you are the perfect knower of the Gita. This story from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Gajendra Moksha, <clears throat> is a story of going to the very essence. Gajendra really was Trinata Pisunichena. He felt himself more humble than a blade of grass. He, was, he became tolerant like a tree. He was ready to offer all respect to others and not to expect any in return. He was really in a humble state of submission before God. When Gajendra is saying here, protect me, my Lord, he's not saying protect my body. He's praying, protect me by always being, by giving me the chance to always remember you. That is real protection. Because the body's going to die. Even if you're an excellent devotee, still your body has to die. Protection is you remember Krishna at the time of death. Protection means you remember Krishna during life, in the good and the bad. So this is what Gajendra, he's just giving himself to Krishna, I'm yours, just accept me. We chant his holy names. Yeah.